But discrimination isn't always that obvious. It's sometimes more subtle, but in many ways more insidious. An institutionalized discrimination that's hidden behind a smiling face. Housing agents who say, well, there are no vacancies right now. That you just didn't qualify for the mortgage because your financial credit history wasn't good enough. Last year, the Federal Reserve Board found African Americans are denied credit for homes at twice the rate white Americans are. And it is pervasive. It's what we found in the banking case in Texas, SACUBank in Texas. Discrimination in lending, discrimination in uh, rendering mortgages. The bank has agreed to change its practices, as you heard from the Assistant Secretary. The bank has also agreed to a $2.1 billion, billion dollar agreement where they'll make $2.1 billion available to families who are low and moderate income across the country for mortgages. About 15,000 low and moderate income people will now be able to buy their own home because of the settlement we announced today. $2.1 billion is by far the largest settlement ever rendered to the federal government to settle a fair housing case. And in closing, the message of today is clear. You've heard it from a number of us now. This is a nation of laws, and this administration will enforce the laws. We'll take questions at this time. Yes, sir. For $2.1 billion that would not have been available to families of low and moderate income, uh, income, uh, low and moderate income families across the country, about 15,000 families, we estimate, estimate, will get mortgages who would not have gotten mortgages otherwise. But aggressively, to take a greater risk on these mortgages, yes. To give families mortgages who they would not have given otherwise, yes. They would not have qualified but for this affirmative action on the part of the bank, yes. Minorities are represented in that low and moderate income group? It is uh, by income, and is it also by minorities? Yes. With the $2.1 billion lending that uh, amount in mortgages, which will be a higher risk, and I'm sure there will be a higher default rate on those mortgages than on the rest of the portfolio. Uh, that, is, that is the remedy that we sought, and the remedy that I would prefer, 15,000 families. This is of a scope so uh, beyond anything that we've really done in the past. Uh, we had one settlement just a couple of weeks ago, which was part and parcel of this, which is in the range of about a billion dollars. But after that, the closest uh, settlement was three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars. So this is of a scope uh, uh, that much surpasses anything we've done in the past. There was the Community Reinvestment Act, or CRA, passed in 1977 during Jimmy Carter's first year in office. The law increased oversight of financial institutions to ensure that they were giving credit to low-income families. We're going to make sure those banks do it and they don't discriminate. But the law went overboard. Institutions made loans they probably didn't want to make because they couldn't seem racist. It empowered these community groups who would then bully the banks, ACORN bullied the banks. Indeed, ACORN, the Associations of Community Organizers for Reform Now, would before long come up with a new tactic, challenging a thrift merger in Illinois, claiming they didn't make the kind of loans that ACORN felt were required under the CRA. A young community organizer named Barack Obama worked closely with the ACORN activists behind the new strategy. Uh, I've been a community organizer and helped design programs at the ground level. And that strategy worked. ACORN prevailed in court, and soon credit standards were being lowered across the country. 
While at first, Fannie actually resisted buying up some of those shaky mortgages, at the tail end of the Clinton administration, Fannie Mae was told to substantially increase the percentage of those mortgages in its portfolio. Acorn's attorney was, well, you guessed it, Barack Obama. He was, you know, I have a background as an attorney. Uh, I've represented affordable housing organizations that build affordable housing, something that's a major issue in the district. Back in the 1990s, they used strong-arm tactics to force banks to give high-risk loans to low-income borrowers with bad credit. Acorn uses a militant tactics. They call it direct action. Sometimes Acorn will actually send people to a bank official's home. Uh, they'll scare him, they'll scare his kids. Again, all in an effort to get the banks to make these bad loans. You've gone back to Chicago right. and civic rights, civil right. rights. Right. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm currently a, 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 a practicing civil rights lawyer, uh, which means that I get involved in a whole range of different uh, issues uh, that touch on issues of race. the subprime mortgage fiasco t uh, that's taking place today. Subprime lending started off as a good idea, helping Americans buy homes who previously couldn't afford to. Financial institutions created new financial instruments that could securitize these loans, slice them into finer and finer risk categories, and spread them out among investors and around the country, as well as around the world. In theory, this should have allowed mortgage lending to be less risky, and more diversified. Who do you think is to blame for this current mortgage and credit crisis? Who do we see about that? Well, I, I think uh, there are a lot of folks who have to take some responsibility. The original idea was a good one, which was let's see if we can distribute risk more broadly and make it easier to provide loans to people who otherwise might be, not be able to get them. Now up until then, Acorn has managed to fly below the radar, but their dangerous practices are coming back to haunt them and the rest of the country. The economic crisis facing the nation is due in large part to this disastrous decision by financial institutions Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to buy up risky loans from small banks. But it's groups like Acorn that force those banks to give out those loans in the first place. What do you think of the Acorn scandal and how do you think it will affect the election? The Acorn scandal is a big one. Acorn has received over $760 million in fees alone. This is what we know about. And there's a lot of stuff that's still kind of bubbling up to the surface. Uh, but here's an organization that essentially helps strong arm a lot of banks into uh, making loans to people who couldn't pay them off, so the so-called ninja loans, no income, no job, no assets. Uh, at the heart of what has kind of brought about the financial collapse is this uh, rather unconventional idea uh, that we would just loan money out uh, if a person had a pulse. Eight years they had a chance the other side here to get this economy right. Eight years! And they're the ones that drove it into the ground and dares criticize when someone is turning it around so that we go in the right direction. Eight years. This didn't happen overnight when we start losing jobs. When President Bush left office, we were losing 750,000 jobs a, a month. What did they do? Nothing. Then you have President Obama come on board, started turning things around. And what did they do? Criticize. Criticize progress of creating jobs again. Criticize trying to create an opportunity for Americans to have good health care again. Criticize the fact that we are able to improve bridges and roads. Criticize the fact that we're going to be able to put more people uh, to approve the money to help the unemployed. Eight years of driving the economy into the ground. One year. Obama had one year, President Obama, to make sure that we begin to restore America to the prosperity that we had eight years prior to the Bush administration. Let's continue to move in the right direction.